Did you know that over 2 million people, including our very own Tim Baker, are earning money by hosting on Airbnb? Whether it be hosting while you're out of town or making the most of that extra room or in-law suite that sits empty for most of the year, think about it as an investment in your future. The beauty with Airbnb is that you are bringing in extra money that you can use to fast track whatever financial goal you may be working on today. It's free to list and Airbnb has a tool that'll help you price your place just right. Worried about your property? Airbnb offers a host guarantee that helps protect your property in the unlikely event that something goes wrong. And you're the boss when you host on Airbnb. Your home, your rules. Host when you want, how you want, list one bedroom or the entire place. It's all up to you. So whether you're looking for some side cash or a steady income, hosting on Airbnb might just be the best investment you have not made yet. When you go to yourfinancialpharmacist.com slash Airbnb and start hosting, you'll receive a $100 Amazon gift card if you generate $500 in booking value by June 30th, 2019. Terms and conditions apply. Kind of looking towards the future and looking down at like all these different loans you could potentially have and all the interest that goes along with them. For me, the motivation was being free of that. You're listening to the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, a show all about inspiring you, the pharmacy professional, on your path towards achieving financial freedom. Hi, I'm Tim Aubert, co-founder of Your Financial Pharmacist. And on today's debt-free theme hour, I welcome Matt and Amy Farley, who paid off $207,000 of student loan debt in just under four years. We talk about what motivated their journey, how they were able to work together, and what's next now that they are debt-free. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. And we have a good one for you this week. I have Matt and Amy Farley with me who paid off over $207,000 in just under four years. And they hit submit on that last payment of debt just a couple days ago as we're sitting here doing this recording today. They've got a great story to share about their journey what worked, how they have worked together effectively as a couple, and now what is the future ahead that they've gone through this journey. You might remember we asked you, the YFP community, what you wanted to hear more of on the podcast and debt-free theme hours was near top of that list. So we have another great one for you today. We're going to hope to continue to feature more of these into the future. So Matt and Amy, welcome to the show and thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Tim. How's it going? Thanks for having us. Hello. Yes, ex- excited. You have an incredible journey. We just talked briefly before the show, and and I know Matt, you and I were messaging back and forth over the past couple of months. But I am excited uh, for our listeners to get a sneak peek into the journey that you went through, uh, and it's really incredible if you think about what you did: two hundred and seven thousand dollars of student loan debt in under a four year period, and just hitting submit on that last payment just two days ago. So first of all, congratulations on doing that. That's an incredible accomplishment. And Matt, I'm guessing as you now log on to the Navian platform and you hit and you see that big zero, that has to be a great feeling, right? <laughs> yeah, honestly, it doesn't even feel real. <laughs> you know, <it's> like <laughs> I'm so used to there being thousands of thousands of dollars on there that I've just kind of resorted to accepting that. But now I log in, it says zero, it feels pretty good. Yeah, it's amazing when you when you log onto the platform and you see hundreds of thousands of dollars and you know, we've talked before, it feels like monopoly money. It doesn't feel real. And you know, sometimes you send in those big payments, you don't see the needle move very much. And I, I felt the same way when when my wife and I uh, hit this journey and, and we've we finished paying off our our debt. Same thing, Navian platform. I was sitting at my kitchen table. I'll never forget the moment, but it was like the fireworks. I, I needed them to come and they never came, bro. So it took a while to really set in the reality of that. But you guys have a bright bright future ahead. So Matt, why don't we start with your background um, in terms of you know undergrad and then into pharmacy school. Tell us a little bit about your journey and some of the debt that you accrued along the way um, in terms of both undergrad and pharmacy school. And then obviously that collectively being the large part of the debt that you were working through paying off. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I went to undergrad. Um, I did four years at the University of Northern Iowa and accumulated about $60,000 of debt. Um, wasn't super wise with how I <laughs> paid for school. I kind of lived on loans and paid for tuition all at the same time. Uh, then I went to pharmacy school at the University of Iowa, accumulated the rest of the debt, um, actually kind of going through pharmacy school, got some pretty good scholarships that paid for 
a little less than half of pharmacy school, but, you know, it just seemed like it still accumulated to when we graduated uh, being at about $187,000. And so um, luckily and fortunately, my wife, Amy, didn't have any debt from undergrad. Uh, so that was kind of the, the number we were looking at when I graduated pharmacy school. Um, and so, you know, after pharmacy school, I took a job as an IT pharmacist. Uh, my background's in IT and informatics, and I've, I've been a part of a couple of startup companies along the way and in pharmacy school. And so I was able to land that job out of school and, um, and just felt really motivated at that point to, to knock out this debt. And so that's the number we started with. And uh, yeah, now I'm working as an, uh, an informatics pharmacist for a pharmaceutical company. Thank you for sharing. And then Amy, talk us a little bit through uh, your background. And uh, as we talked before the show, my understanding is you, you grew up in a little bit more of a frugal environment and you kind of strapped your way through this with scholarships and ultimately cash flowing a master's degree. Um, and so I guess, uh, you know, we can blame Matt for all this debt, right? Oh, absolutely. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's my fault. I remind you about that. <laughs> Once in a while, but no, yeah. So I, I grew up in a really frugal, um, house where my parents didn't make much, but they worked very, very hard to, um, use every penny and give us a great upbringing. Um, and then they trained us, trained all, me and my siblings along the way too, of, um, budgeting techniques and worked really hard alongside us to, um, find a lot of scholarships going into college. So yeah, I went uh, and got my undergrad at the University of Northern Iowa as well, um, but I was able to pay for all of that uh, using scholarships that my parents kind of helped me figure out and learn how to do. Um, and then I started working as a high school choir director um, and decided that I wanted to get my master's. Uh, so I did that online while working um, and while we were starting to pay off all of this debt. Um, and just like you said, we, we cash flowed my master's. That's awesome. And so the work you're doing now is, is in music education and you'd mentioned, uh, directing the high school choir, correct? Yeah. Yep. So I direct show choirs and your regular choir that you think of, and then a jazz choir as well. Um, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. So, so Matt, how many, uh, thank you cards have you written to Amy's, uh, parents <laughs> for helping out with all those scholarships? So, oh, yeah, I mean, definitely. We, we talk about <laughs> it. I haven't written any cards, but we definitely talk about it. <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. So what, one of the questions I want to ask, and I'd love to hear from both of you on this is we, we talk a lot in this show about, you know, the why, the motivations, the, the what's behind the hustle and the grit. And, you know, for, ev for everybody that often is different, but when I hear, your story, $207,000 of, of debt um, that you paid off in, in less than, than four years. To me, that really says there's a significant motivation and why around getting this debt off of your shoulders for, for whatever reason. So Matt, let's start with you. T talk me through some of the motivations of why you wanted to have this debt paid off. And, and let me even add on to that, I guess. Was it always that way? Or can you recall a moment where that transition had happened? Yeah, you know, for, for me, uh, my view of money throughout this process has shifted a lot. Um, I, I discovered a book, The Total Money Makeover, when I was uh, in my second year of pharmacy school that shifted a lot of how I viewed money and possessions in general, right? You know, I, I think mm -hmm. I used to view um, when people had a nice car, I thought that they were successful. You know, now I almost view that as <laughs> a negative, you know, not that it's bad to have a nice car, but um, I, I always kind of wonder if that car has a payment attached to it um, or if that, mm -hmm. you know, ginormous house has a payment attached to it. And, um, and so for me, that was when I started this process of viewing money differently uh, and viewing my student loans differently, right? It, I kind of just thought, when I was in pharmacy school that, yes, I'm taking out money for school, but I'll have so much income that it won't really matter, right? That mm -hmm. my lifestyle will be able to be whatever I want it to be. Um, and I won't have to think about money very much because, you know, we'll have that six figure income that a pharmacist gets. And so, uh, you know, we, we graduated um, and just kind of recognizing that 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 was a huge number and that when you look at the take-home pay that you actually get as a pharmacist there really isn't as much as you might think right and so 
mm-hmm. kind of looking towards the future and looking down at like all these different loans you could potentially have and all the interest that goes along with them. For me, the motivation was being free of that. You know, when you're, when you're mm-hmm. talking about loans of six, 7% on this debt, and then you ha- if you have a car payment, you know, you add in three to 5% and then your mortgage is three to 5% or whatever, yeah. right? You start doing the math on this over 10 to 40 years on some of these loans and it really eats away at your financial success. And so for me, a lot of my motivation was just looking towards the future and wanting to have options for the things that we wanted to do. You know, I love working, but it would be nice if I didn't have to, right? So, Mm -hmm. or it'd be nice if we could just take three months off and think about things and, and, or, you know, like I love being a pharmacist, but maybe someday I want to start my own company or something. It just seems like the options are, are available to you if you become financially free from these loans. Right. Yeah. And I, and I love that, Matt, because we, we talked before the show a little bit that, you know, having options, it, it's very difficult to put a number to how valuable that is. So, you know, I, I've talked to pharmacists before that maybe they want to have an option, like you mentioned, in pursuing something entrepreneurial or they love their work, but they want to have the choice of doing it or how much, or, you know, maybe they're, they're burned out and they're ready to seek something new, or maybe they have an ill child and want to spend some more time at home. Wh- whatever would be the case, the point is you have options, right? And that is incredibly freeing and it's very difficult in a financial plan to put a number on that. And I, I'm so glad that you had mentioned that. The, the other thing I really appreciate your comment there is just the concept of, of the future. And I think, you know, you had mentioned if you look at really a pharmacist take home pay after taxes and, and all the things that come out of your paycheck, that dollar amount isn't necessarily as big as you may think it is. And when you look at the goals or things you need to achieve 20, 30, 40 years from now, um, you know, th- that's not necessarily a whole lot of time to be able to get those things done. And, and there's a lot of diligence that needs to be had there. So, so Amy, same, same question for you. Tell me a little bit about some of the motivations and why for, for you guys to be so aggressive, because the reality is, and you know this well, is that as you're dumping all this money at, at Stu Loans, it means you're not doing necessarily some other things and there is some sacrifice there. So what was the motivation for, for you to be able to pay this off so quickly? Yeah, I think um, one of the other things that was a motivation for both of us was our faith and um, just wanting to be free from the control of money. Um, I think that we're, we're called to do that um, in our faith. And so um, just wanting to be free from that control and the love of money in that way so that we can give to others freely, um, that we can, um, use our money to bless other people really easily. Um, and then I, I think the other, another side that Matt didn't really touch on either is, um, being able to give back to our kids or our future generations, Mm -hmm. um, you know, wanting to pay for their college or, um, give them experiences that maybe we weren't able to have growing up, mm-hmm. um, those type of things too, just so that we have kind of a freedom financially to, um, live, live the way that we would, we would like to. Love that. Love that. Matt, you had mentioned, um, that when you had initially started, you guys were kind of thinking all in on two years, which I look at those numbers and I'm like, that's crazy talk. But, uh, and then you, and then you had slowed that down, slowed that down quote uh, a little bit and, and you did it in less than four. So tell us about that decision to, to pivot, slow down, be a little bit more flexible. Cause I think that's important for our listeners to hear that is that sometimes the, the plan changes, right? That's just the reality. So talk us through that. Yeah, you know, kind of the trajectory we're on wasn't super sustainable. You know, I, I think it's it's a good thing to be intense, but I also think that if you if you view getting to the point uh, where you are debt free as like the end all be all of like accomplishment in your life, it you're kind of going to be <laughs> let down, right? Like you're going to get zero. Yes. Like, okay, well, that was probably not worth like killing myself for it. we it was really important for us to start a family when we did and we were we had been living in an apartment and we wanted to move to a house and kind of get closer to work and um and so we we made that decision about a year into that aggressive payoff that we're going to just slow this down um we're going to try to uh, build up some down payment for a house and then mm-hmm. have kids which obviously is expensive and we didn't, we didn't go crazy. We, you know, we bought a townhouse and we definitely did things that were below our means so we could continue to be aggressive. But, um, 
but I guess it was just a heart change about how, you know, viewing the debt. I almost was kind of idolizing it. Like this is going to, you know, this is the reason for life, (laughs) you know? Um, And while I think it's really important, uh, I I definitely think, you know, while you're paying off debt, it's important to make it a sustainable process. Um, I I almost kind of pair it to like losing weight, right? Like if you go on a crash Mm -hmm. diet, it's not something that's going to be sustainable. But if you learn the fundamentals of eating right and exercising and having like a good lifestyle, that's actually something that will last a lifetime. So I guess that's, that's sort of the change in mindset for us a little bit. So as I look at that number, $207,000 in just under four years, you know, my, my first thought is I want to know exactly how Matt and, and Amy did this. So as you look back on that journey, you know, give us some insight for our listeners that maybe are struggling with a similar debt load and have desires to become debt-free, but are, but are, struggling with trying to figure out how do I actually do this? What does it look like? So Amy, what was the secret of success for you guys in terms of getting this done? Is it, is it the budgeting working together? You know, how, how did you practically get to the point where you could free up enough money each and every month to make extra payments towards your student loans? Yeah. Well, I would say the budget is number one. Um, and we use a software called YNAB, which is you need a budget, yeah. Y-N-A-B. Um, and one of the things in there is that every penny goes somewhere. So we, we got to the point where we were living on last month's income, which I think was huge in all of this. So we knew going into each month, here is every penny we have to spend this month. And mm-hmm. um, Matt's our budgeting guy. So he would make sure that every penny went somewhere. Um, and we really worked through like, what is the minimum that, or, you know, what, what is actually what we need for groceries? What is what we need for all of these things? And then every penny that we didn't need to use went immediately to debt. So, um, I think that that's a big thing is knowing where your money is going and having a plan for it so that you don't Mm -hmm. just randomly spend. And all of a sudden you can't make that loan permit, you know? Absolutely. So it sounds like you, you guys use a zero-based budgeting process. I'm guessing if you're using YNAB, uh, my wife and I use that tool as well. It's fantastic. Um, we'll link to it in the show notes. And I think it's like seven bucks a month, right? Something like that. If I remember, right, 80 bucks a year, something not not too crazy. Yeah. Um, but it is built off of, and you've heard us talk before on this podcast about a zero-based budget, which essentially to Amy's point is accounting for every single, literally every single penny uh, prior you know, to, to earning that rather than tracking those expenses at the end of the month. And so we we teach this process. We have some blog posts we've talked about on the podcast. If our listeners go to yourfinancialpharmacist.com slash budget, they can download an Excel template that will walk them through that process. And then they can upload it into a tool like YNAB or every dollar envelopes, you know, mint whatever tool that they would want to use. So so Matt, you are, it sounds like the the budgeting person. So mm-hmm. how does this work for the two of you? Are you taking the lead and then you're bringing Amy in as, as kind of the final decision or to make sure there's certain goals or things you're trying to achieve that you're on the same page. What, what does this look like week by week, month by month? Yeah. So we, we talk pretty regularly about the budget. Uh, generally I'll, I'll put it together. And then if there's anything that's a major change, we'll talk about it together. We use the functionality in YNAB where when you're making a purchase, you can log what you're purchasing and and actually check against how much money you have, right? So for buying groceries, mm-hmm. I know I have $200 left in that category. So that's sort of how we communicate is through the app in a way, because we can just know how much is there. And then when we'd have big purchases to make, or we would have you know big decisions about how much to pay off towards loans, typically I would just consult with Amy first before doing that. You know, it, it seems like we're we're at this point with our budget where it's standard of what's going to happen. And then anything outside of that, we have a discussion about. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I feel like I'm blessed that Amy is very just frugal in general. So if I just put her on (laughs) autopilot, she's not going to, you know, (laughs) rack up a credit card or something like that, which is great. So Matt, besides the budget, anything else you'd add in terms of the secrets of, of both you and Amy being able to pay off so much debt in such a short period of time? Yeah, there's a couple actually. You know, I, one that I don't doesn't work for everyone, but we happen to both be paid biweekly, and so when you get paid biweekly, 
you can live off two paychecks a month and then there's actually tw- 26 paychecks a year that get paid out so for both of us we have two extra paychecks each year mm. um so we basically mm-hmm. live on 24 paychecks but get paid 26 paychecks and that was actually really helpful for us from the perspective of like little bonuses and big chunks of money that came off the debt. So I think anytime you can do that, that's, that's really helpful. And then we use the, the, a debt snowball calculator in Excel mm-hmm. to really visualize, you know, the, the dates that certain payments were going to be made. And uh, this, yeah, this, this probably isn't totally popular with everyone, but we didn't consolidate our debt. We had, Mm -hmm. lots of little debts and that was almost helpful for us to get motivated you know it's like okay we paid off another eight thousand dollar debt and then we paid off a ten thousand dollar one and you could almost see that progress now if someone's more mathematically motivated that that doesn't make sense sometimes right but that was helpful sure well and i i think you're highlighting just just to make a comment there i think you're highlighting two very important things that are behavioral aspects you know that allowed you to be successful so you know for somebody and and maybe it doesn't matter for somebody else but for you guys if you're paying off debt in a very short period of time and you're able to see that progress because you have multiple little debts that you're paying off and rolling into the next one rolling into the next one and if you were to consolidate or refinance into one big payment and that would have maybe lost some motivation along the way, especially when you think about a shorter time period and interest that's accruing. Maybe that behavior was more important, you know, than the math uh, along the way. And the the other thing I love that you said, Matt, is is the concept of the biweekly pay and allowing you to have some chunks of money that you could strategically put towards goals or things that you're working on or, or debt payments, whatever it be. Because I think, it, and I'm guessing, it sounds like for you and Amy those moments where you had those those bigger payments or those bonus type of payments, those are the moments where you feel like you're really getting some momentum that keeps you motivated to keep going and going and going. And I see this with the model you're describing. I see this with tax refunds or things that people use, but those wins along the way really help keep the motivation as you're in it for you know the long haul, even here just under four years, but obviously it's a grind while you're going through that. Definitely. It's like for us, it was really motivating every time we went to the next $10,000 increment, right? So, okay, we're in the 50s mm-hmm. now, we're in the 40s now, we're in the 30s now. So, yeah. the chunks of money help with that when you, you can jump those those increments. Amy, one of the questions I have for you and and Matt, certainly feel free to build off of it. But as as everybody knows who's listening, you know, finances and relationships sometimes are like oil and water, right? And, you know, it can be difficult to, to be on the same page. Obviously, as we zoom out, you two have been very successful. My question is, you know, has it always been rainbows and, and cupcakes? I mean, has there been difficulties along the way? Or if not, what really have been the strategies that have allowed the two of you to work work together and to, and to be on the same page towards this common goal? Yeah, I think I think we have worked pretty well together and started off um, working really hard to be on the same page from the get-go, which has helped a lot. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been roses the entire time. I think there have been a lot mm-hmm. of times when we've disagreed where our money should go. Um, I know that like when we were buying a house, I really, really, really wanted that single family home. Um, and Mm -hmm. Matt was like, Nope, we can't spend that much money. We can't, you know? And so we had arguments and disagreements in that way where we'd, um, want to spend the money in different ways. Um, and I think, I think just being willing to sit down and really talk through it and, um, you know, make compromises where it's necessary, but, uh, also remind each other, frequently that like someday we will be able to have that single family home if we want it, you know, but, but for now we're going to make this sacrifice. Um, and so, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's been good to, uh, just work together and be involved for both of us to be involved in it. So that when those, um, hard times come up where we don't agree that we can look back and be like, okay, here's where the progress is. Here's where we're going. Um, you know, at this point in life, we'll be able to do that. So I think, I think it's hard in our society where there's a lot of comparison to other people. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you get on Instagram and you see, oh, my friend just went to Cabo. Oh, crap. You know, like I would like to, (laughs) but, um, but just having to be like, that's not for us right now. And that does not fulfill life or (laughs) and um, having to remind each other of those things frequently. 
Well, and, and, and the reality, we'll, we'll talk more about this here, here in a few minutes about, you know, what's kind of ahead. The reality is if, if you guys want to go to Cabo in the future, you're certainly going to have the right. option, you know, to do that among with many other things uh, that you want to do because of the position you put yourself in. What, what I love about what you said there, um, Amy, is, is the reality of, you know, two people being involved in the process. And even if one person's taking the lead, I think if, if two people can get on the same page with the vision, that for you all, it was, you know, that the debt free was the vision that you were really working towards. And obviously that was going to be able to allow you to achieve the other things that were most important to you, the why types of factors. If you can get on the same page with that shared vision, the month to month budgeting, I won't say is easy, but it becomes easier because that vision is in the background, right? You've shared the direction and now it's a matter of month by month. What do we need to do uh, to get there? So Matt, what, one of the questions I, I wanted to ask for you, and, and really on behalf of the listeners, because one of the things I, I often get asked is, well, what about retirement during this aggressive debt repayment? And obviously, you balance other things. So you, you purchase a townhome, you cash flow to master's, you cash flow to car. But what was your retirement strategy? And were, were you contributing? And if not, like how did you reconcile the delay of doing that? For sure. Yeah. So we did contribute enough for a lot of um, those four years to get the match at our employers. Um, the Towards the last year, kind of bumped that up to more like 10% of, of my take home or mm -hmm. sorry, of my pay. And I did struggle with this a little bit because you'll hear different strategies, right? When you're getting out of debt, you know, should you, should you be investing or should you not? For me, I wanted a little bit of a mixed bag approach, knowing that I guess what I would say, I was rather, I'd rather cut my lifestyle than I would cut the potential compounding you get from investing, right? So mm -hmm. um, I wanted a little bit going in there to just like get things started. Um, but I, I wasn't as aggressive as I would have liked to be, obviously, if I didn't have any debt. You know, I, I guess I wouldn't ever yell at someone for like not investing. It's really hard for me to mathematically mm -hmm. not take a match from an employer though, you know, <laughs> just yeah. to give that up is hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I share that with you and, and we, we kind of preach that here as well of, you know, the, the free money and it's hard to dispute that. And, and I think the other thing that it does is it keeps it top of mind. You know, it doesn't distract you from the goal, but it keeps it top of mind and you feel like you're making some momentum, even if it's not the 15, 20% that you want to get to, uh, you're, you're starting to move that snowball, right? And that's going to eventually get downhill and uh, pick up some speed. So Matt, Matt, this next question I have for you, since you were the one that had all the baggage with the student <laughs> loans. So um, <laughs> as, as you look back now on this journey, you know, eight plus years of, of, of school, uh, a Korean undergrad debt, and then obviously that, that compounded in pharmacy school, you know, I'm really asking this question on behalf of the students that, that may be listening. If you could start all over again, you know, what would you do, do differently and what would you have done during school to help minimize this position? If, I mean, honestly, if I was coming out of high school right now, I know that's not a lot of the pharmacy students listening. I, I would be so much more aggressive towards scholarships and, and trying mm. to be involved in, in those types of activities. In pharmacy school, it's hard, you know, it, there aren't as many scholarships to go around. And so I think the, the main thing you can do is minimize your lifestyle. Um, we, we did have some scholarships and I was able to get some of those, but you know, I think mostly I just wouldn't live off loans, right? Like we, mm -hmm. we went to Europe off loans, which was obviously a really stupid decision. Um, it, I think it's easy to tell yourself when you're in the situation and pharmacy school is stressful, right? That you, you kind of deserve to have like fun activities. Mm -hmm. You deserve maybe to go somewhere for spring break or you deserve to make take a really awesome trip in the summer. And I guess I would encourage people to not do that. And, and recognize that like your lifespan is, you know, likely going to be fairly long. And this is just a season of life uh, where things are hard. Mm -hmm. And so if you can minimize that lifestyle as much as possible, that helps a lot. And, and then just get creative. You know, I, I don't, I'm sure there are more scholarships out there than I was aware of um, to apply for. And, and so I, I guess that'd be my advice. And then, you know, when, I guess the last part of that is if you're considering residency, I think residency is a great thing from the perspective of experience and kind of widening your network. But I, I do think it's 
it's often glanced over on the opportunity loss that's that's it costs to actually do a residency. You know, I, I was considering doing a two year residency in administration when I came out of school. There's no way I'd be debt free if I would have done that. Now that's maybe not the worst thing if mm-hmm. maybe that's exactly what you want to do for your career. But I guess um, kind of the, what I tell pharmacy students a lot is employers are looking for you to solve their problems, not necessarily be qualified for a job. And so if you can work hard and you can understand how things work in the field that you want to get into, it's possible to do things without a residency. Now, I'm not discouraging people from doing that, right? But I I do think it needs to be considered when you're actually looking at your finances. Amen to that. And I and I hope our listeners heard heard that last part there. I, I I firmly stand with you that, you know, that that first door opening is is such a critical one to open. And sometimes it requires the training to get there. But once that door opens, if you have a good work ethic and you're somebody that can identify problems and propose solutions, um, you're going to be very successful and other doors will open into the future. So I think that's, that's great wisdom there. So Amy, here, here you are, you and you and Matt are a fresh 48 hours off of being completely uh, debt free from your student loans. And, you know, obviously you 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 guys have a good household income. My my question is what's next? I mean, what, what's ahead? What, what from here becomes a priority of you were making massive student loan payments and now you've got this monthly income that's freed up. What's the game plan going forward? You know, I, I think that's a great question. Um, we haven't talked a ton, but we have um, kind of looked at the things that we weren't able to put money into um, that we would like to kind of as life goals, um, putting a little bit more into retirement, paying off, um, you know, being able to pay for our kids college, things like that, and starting to save up for those now. So we've already done a little bit of looking at how we want to um shift around this money into new places. Um, but, I, but it, it also means that we have a little bit more freedom to kind of enjoy life. So hopefully maybe mm-hmm. a trip to Cabo or, you know, um, I, I think that there are some of those things that we, um, will definitely take advantage of now. Um, it also just frees us up to be able to, um, you know, f- once we have more kids or whatever that we, if we would like to get a bigger house to fit those kids, then we'd be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, we haven't really made an exact plan, but it just opens up, um, us to live, live in a new way. As you might imagine, I've, I've already put together a a spreadsheet of (laughs) where where our money is going. I thought so maybe. (laughs) So we haven't talked through it. You might yeah. want to fill Amy in. Yeah. <laughs> no, but and what I'm excited to, you know, hear from you guys over the next few months and year and, and beyond is, you know, thinking of the zero-based budgeting yeah. process, what's so powerful about that is you had a line item for student loans. It was a very, very big line item, right? In YNAB, you know. And now the question is, what does that become? You know, is it is it giving? Is it experiences with the family? Is it uh, entrepreneurial interest? Is it buying a home? What What is that? But that really becomes that exciting conversation about life after debt-free, which is something we're going to be talking much more about uh, on the podcast going forward. So Matt, one question. I, I know you mentioned you you read Total Money Makeover. So that you know is an indicator to me that you're, you're a financial uh, reader slash yep. nerd probably. Um, and so my, my question uh, for you is, you know, how important was reading or listening to podcasts? You know, how important was that to your success? And is there a specific book or two or resource out there that you would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, definitely. Um, So I I think the biggest thing is just kind of consistently reading or listening to anything financially minded, because I, I think it causes you to pay attention to what's going on, which is half the battle. You know, you might not be the best budgeter or the best investor, but if you were just kind of know what's going on with your money and understand the products that you're purchasing from an investment standpoint, that is huge to me. So some of the, some of the books that I read and I, I'm just going to preface it. I don't agree with all these books. I don't think they're like perfect. Uh, Some of them tell you to do unwise things, but uh, I'll teach you to be rich for me was uh, an interesting book to read, to understand investing a little bit better. Um, I forget the author's name, but he, he talks a 
some about using credit cards more than I would be comfortable with using it. We actually did use a credit card to pay for a lot of our expenses and we're able to do that without any concern of actually carrying a balance. But I know that's not the case for everyone. So if you have a tendency of doing that, right, I'd say avoid that. Um, mm-hmm. We, I listened to uh, Dave Ramsey's podcast pretty consistently mm-hmm. and I recently discovered yours. So I've been listening to yours recently too. And I think is another great podcast to listen to, to understand what's going on with your money and hear from other folks that are like-minded and so I, I will teach you to be rich is a uh, Ramit Sethi book. That's a great uh, book. I would also recommend that. And I, I share the same feelings um, that you do. There's some things in there where, you know, I may approach them differently, but I, I really like the way he teaches. I think it's very easy to understand and it's a very digestible uh, book and resource. So we'll link to that in our show notes uh, as well. But I, w- I would echo uh, Matt, your comment about uh, just absorbing information. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I'll listen to something or read to something and I'll walk away with a very tangible action item. But many times it's just that keeping the topic front of mind, right? And uh, that's true with anything, you know, it could be uh, your your goals around uh, spirituality, it could be your relationship, but the things that are most important to you, always having those uh, top of mind and, and making sure that you're always prioritizing those, setting goals on those and reflecting on on how things are going. So, and one thing, if I could add, I don't mean to interrupt, but one of the things that actually I learned the most on that got me started with investing was a frontline documentary on PBS called Mm -hmm. Retirement Gamble. Um, It's like a 40 minute video and it's pretty old at this point, but it, for some reason it actually resonated with me for how to invest. What's an expense ratio? What's a mutual fund? What's an index fund? And, that was really helpful for me to actually watch. So I would suggest that to anyone who's interested in learning more about that as well. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank, thank you for that. And Matt and Amy, thank you so much for your time, for coming on uh, to share your journey. Really an incredible journey of paying off over $207,000 in just under four years. And I know you've inspired me personally, and I'm confident you're going to do uh, the same for our listeners. And I can't wait to hear and talk from you in the, in the years to come to see the amazing things that you're doing. So th- thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. You can do it, everybody. Yes. Thank you, guys. Before we wrap up today's episode of the podcast, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Airbnb. Today's the day to consider joining the community of more than 2 million people that are earning extra cash by hosting on Airbnb. Whether it's hosting while you're out of town or making the most of that extra room that sits empty for most of the year, think about it as an investment in your future. Maybe it's paying extra on student loans. Maybe it's investing more for the future or saving for kids college. Whatever it be, this can help you fast track the financial goal that you're working on today. It's free to listen. Airbnb has a tool that'll help you price your place just right. Again, there's no need to worry about your property as Airbnb offers a host guarantee that helps protect your property in the unlikely event that something goes wrong. And you're the boss when you host on Airbnb. Your home, your rules. Host when you want, how you want. List one bedroom or the entire place. It's completely up to you. So whether you're looking for some side cash or a steady income, hosting on Airbnb might just be the best investment you haven't made yet. When you go to yourfinancialpharmacist.com slash Airbnb and start hosting, you'll receive a $100 Amazon gift card if you generate $500 in booking value by June 30th, 2019. Terms and conditions do apply. And one last thing, if you could do us a favor, if you like what you heard on this week's episode, please make sure to leave us a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, make sure to head on over to yourfinancialpharmacist.com where you'll find a wide array of resources designed specifically for you, the pharmacy professional, to help you on the path towards achieving financial freedom. Have a great rest of your week. 